And we're live. Hey, everybody. Welcome into the App Flip and Hippo's YouTube channel. I'm Star the Flip and Hippo, and with me tonight is a very special guest, Rockstar Flipper. Say hi, Casey. Hi, Casey. Oh, <laughs> hi, Stars fans. How's everybody doing? So if you are here because you follow Casey and you're not familiar with myself or my channel, um, I am one half of a team. Keith is my silent partner in life and business. Um, we both do this full time. We resell full time on a variety of platforms, and um, we have a YouTube channel and a Facebook group. And uh, I focus on jeans and plush mostly, and Keith does everything else, as well as run the Shopify hotel side with Keith. Now, if you don't know who Casey is, you've been living in a hole for the last five years, but do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I do all that same stuff that she does. No, I, uh, <laughs> I've been a seller for, uh, I lived here for 15 years, so probably like 13 years. eBay, Amazon Posh, and of course the Shopify store with Keith. I sell some stuff directly through like social media, Instagram, when people ask, I'll sell it to them. Uh, YouTube channel as well, all the good things that Star just named off, and uh, yeah, we have fun here, and we talk to you guys, and we teach you guys, and we even help you get inventory sometimes. And we even are entertaining sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> More times not, but yes. <laughs> I'm going to say hi to some folks in the chat. No, I'm in the Frogger here, guys. That's Bill and David. Very good friends. Hey. Ours. They have the Blue Wrench. So say hello to them. And Rob. Um, Beth is here from Georgia. Rob, Rob. Oh. Robert's in the house, you guys. That zombie bargain hunter. He also has a wrench. Say hello to him. He's my plush partner in crime. Uh, Jamie Pace is even here. Wow, Aurora Styles cherry picker. Myra, that's Myra. Aurora is Myra, and uh, Better Barbie. So welcome in, guys. Thanks for yeah. stopping by, everybody. We met Better Barbie at eBay Open. eBay Open. Yep. So tonight we're going to talk about a very controversial topic. And I think it's a little controversial because um, I keep hearing myself echo on Casey's end, and that's distracting. But I'll try to ignore it. Um, I think it's controversial because there's two, there's three kinds of people in this world when it comes to Vero and knockoffs. There's those of us that have done the research and understand it, and there's people who are new and just confused and don't understand it. And then the third group of people, those are the turds that choose not to be educated and or stick their head in the sand and pretend that ignorance will um, let the law forgive you when you break it. I think then, our, fa our favorite people are the ones that just post something without, like they just guess. <laughs> they literally just guess. Yeah, or they know darn well it's wrong, but they don't care. Um, because there's people that think, well, if I'm not hurting anyone else, it's not like murder, it's not like a big crime that you're, you're, you're committing. But it is it is fraud. It is against the law. Um, knockoffs are what I'm referring to. And um, ignorance doesn't forgive you. Like if you ran a stop sign and you told the cop you didn't know it was there, you're still going to get a ticket. Pretty much. So um, we're here to help those of you that are confused or new and don't understand it tonight to understand it. Um, and hopefully those of you that are turds will listen too and maybe change your minds a little bit. Um, like I said, tonight's going to be some self love, and that means I'm going to call some of y'all turds. It just happens when I'm giving up self love. I don't pull any punches. Um, so let's just jump on in. Oh, wait, before we jump on in, the reason we're doing this is because at least twice a day, it's a topic in Casey's group, right? At least, <laughs> at least twice a day. And Keith and I are moderators in his group. Um, so we absolutely help him when the arguments start and the misinformation starts coming out. Um, I personally get a ton of messages a day, emails, questions about it. I'm constantly explaining it to people. And then just a couple weeks ago, right before Thanksgiving, Casey and I were on the phone and we actually had a big old conversation about it. And we actually did like this deep dive and we were looking up different brands just to see what the different brands rules were for their particular brand because they can all make their own rules up mm -hmm. and it was crazy i mean we did what like an hour we were looking at harley davidson yeah. and 
American, American Eagle, Eagle. Um, Abercrombie and Fitch, mm. but they all have different roles. So we did this deep dive on it. And then like right after that, I started getting more questions about it. And I'm like, why don't we just do a video? So. Yep. Self-admittedly, I had never, so I've read the Vero page and scrolled through and clicked on things, but I had never actually read it to the extent that we read it the other night. Um, like actually word, like line by line. And every company is a little different. Most of them have similar wording on the normal stuff, like don't sell fake stuff. Don't, you know, don't do crap like that. But there's a few different ones where they actually lay out. And Harley Davidson, God bless them, actually has a really good, uh, cleanly laid out, easy to understand one. Um, they, they actually put like, you can sell our products with the Harley logo and name on it as long as it's real, we're good with that. There are some companies that say, don't do that. Like literally we'll take you down. Like I think Lululemon is one that doesn't have it on the Vero list, but they do it. Um, and LuLaRoe also for a while was doing it. So there are some companies that are much nicer than other companies when they put their stuff out there. They're cool with you reselling. They don't mind, like they get it, but there's some companies that are just harsh. Like Rosetta Stone is an absolute no-go. They just do not care, so. And I think they weren't even on the Vero list. And they're not even on the Vero list. Yeah, just to mark it off. Like that to me is almost like, we're gonna be turds to you, but we're not gonna <laughs> warn you. <laughs> exactly. Like that, um, that's a slap in the face to me. <laughs> so Casey and I actually have a little list of myths that we wanna talk about, but before we go into those, if you aren't familiar with what the Vero program is, I have the website up. Um, let me share that with you guys. And if you want me to screen share, I will. Otherwise, I'm just going to kind of read it to you. Um, somebody it, just, oh, before you go, somebody just <laughs> asked who beat me up. I accidentally bit my lip. I slipped and caught myself on the thing going out of the thing, and I bit my lip really hard. I didn't think anyone would notice that, but it happened last night late. He got punched when he was filming a parking <laughs> video. <laughs> hey, hey, no, no. None of that nonsense. Can you imagine if I was filming them in this day and age during this stress level during these people? Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. oh, I'm glad I stopped. Anyways, okay. Oh, so, you and David had tacos tonight because it's yeah. Taco Tuesday. It is. So I see Greg in the chat. Hi, Greg. If I saw you, if not, I'm imagining things, but hi. Okay. So the Vero is, it stands for, it's V E R O. What it stands for is the Verified Rights Owner Program. It is a program that eBay offers to verified rights owners, basically brands. It allows them to create a profile page, which allows them to share information about their intellectual property with the eBay community. So for example, you can provide information about, and they're talking to the brand, um, we'll use Harley Davidson. So if Harley Davidson wanted to be on the Vero participant profile list, they would provide a list of their intellectual property, including their brands, trademarks, and copyrights, the potential consequences of infringing on their rights, the conditions under which products bearing their intellectual property may be sold, how to contact them with questions or concerns, and other FAQs. So every brand can have its own rules about what you can and can't sell and what you can do with their intellectual property. And so the Vero list, the link I put in there for you guys, has every single brand that has submitted a profile to eBay to be part of the Vero participant program. But not everyone that's on the list is going to let you sell their stuff. Like we mentioned Rosetta Stone. If you have Rosetta Stone up, they're going to sue your ass. <laughs> and they're going to do it with a quickness. And they're not even on the list. Nope. So yeah, so that preface is so important because that list, I don't know, what do we say? There was probably a couple hundred companies on that list. I, I don't know if you scroll through it, maybe 200, 300 at most. There, remember, there are millions of companies in the world, thousands that are regularly listed. So obviously not every company is on there. And just so people are aware, there is no legal requirement to A, be on, on eBay's Vero list. Number one, that's just for the eBay website. Remember, a company can enforce their trademarks across any platform for all they care. And Amazon and Posh, they don't even have Vero lists. So it's not a requirement. eBay kind of did that as a, I would say a gesture of, of good faith, sort of, to kind of give companies uh, an avenue. But it is not a requirement for them to be on that list at all for any platform. And eBay is not the only one they can take you down off of. Also, beyond just the 
uh, removal of your listing or getting your account suspended potentially or something like that, the court systems for suing of trademark doesn't require any of that. In fact, it technically doesn't even require a cease and desist. Most companies will send a cease and desist if they want to go around the platform, but it is not actually a legal requirement. You can just straight up have someone served. Like, take it from experience, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Casey um, listed a Minecraft shirt. <laughs> and you guys, longtime viewers of me know whenever I show Minecraft plush, I'm always telling you guys, make sure that anything you sell with Minecraft has Mojang on it. You have to make sure it is an official copyrighted product of Mojang, whether it's a plush, a book. I've sold books before. A shirt. If you don't have Mojang on it, they will contact eBay and have you suspended. And Casey actually had that happen to him, you guys, right? <laughs> Yeah, like uh, yet yeah, now newer also mine, uh, Minecraft owned by Microsoft, is it, right? So if it has Microsoft on it, I think it's good as well. But back then, uh, this was, God, five years ago, four or five years ago, I did list a Minecraft shirt that I got, I think at like Salvation Army, and it must have been something somebody printed. It didn't have the official tag. In fact, it didn't have anything on it, and it just said Minecraft on the shirt. And it took them less than a day. We posted it at night, and by the morning, I woke up to a takedown. And no warning, no nothing, literally a suspension. I think, what did I get, three days or five days? You had three days. Three days, yeah. But you also didn't know. And, and that, no idea. That goes in with the whole, it doesn't matter if you're ignorant or don't know. I'm not saying ignorant in a derogatory manner. I'm saying, like, you just can't be blissfully unaware and expect that to be an excuse. That doesn't excuse no. you. And it doesn't matter. Somebody asked, does it matter if it was used versus new? No. That was a used shirt pulled right off a Salvation Army store shelf. So they didn't care. All right. So we're going to jump into the myths. I see. Um, oh, boy. I'm going to butcher this name so bad. Net Kazen. Mm -hmm. Questions. Um, you're perfectly usually okay to sell most items. Um, you can't know every brand that's on the Vera list. Some of them aren't on there. And as Donna mentioned, some have submitted a profile but asked not to be shown. Um, just make sure that what you have is authentic, not a knockoff, um, has the official brands and tags on them, and know which brands will absolutely pull you down. For instance, you do not ever want to sell the North Face new attacks. You can sell it used, but they had some issues with employees stealing their products a while back and, and reselling them online. So. They actually employed people whose full-time jobs are to go online and find who's selling their items, new tags, and they'll have you. Um, I think they do a cease and desist before they'll do anything else to you. Yep. Um, but you can sell their used stuff because they're not worried. If it's used, they don't think that you're one of their employees that still stuff. Yep. So North Face is one you need to know. Um, Patagonia. Patagonia, new tag. The Patagonia one is more, and I think North Face incorporated this, but Patagonia was more because they have a guaranteed lifetime uh, replacement on their items. And part of trademark is that if you can't sell an item and they call it uh, materialistically different and you cannot guarantee a replacement for the customer and they can, so that makes you different than them. And so they don't want you selling brand new for that reason uh, through Patagonia, only used. Yep, and um, what a we just mentioned it, the R word, Rose. Rosetta Stone. Yeah, sorry, Rosetta Stone. You can't sell anything of theirs. Um, if you have any doubt, just ask someone. Um, but just because something's on the Vero list doesn't mean you can't sell it. And right. that's one of the most common questions I get. Um, I'm new to eBay, and this is what the message will say. I'm new to eBay Star, and I see American Eagle and Old Navy on this list. How are you selling their jeans? Well, just because they're on the Vero list doesn't mean that I can't sell their stuff. That's just the profile that they have submitted to eBay that um, tells us what we're allowed to sell from their intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So let's get into the myths. The Vero list myths, and then we'll get into the knockoffs, which is a whole other knockoffs, I think, get both of us riled up. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
So, uh, yeah, so Har- what you just said, Harley is really good because they do spell it out. And their rules are really relaxed. And most companies are this way. You know, we see everyone selling those brands um, that just don't sell fake stuff. And don't the one thing they don't like people to do is Photoshop or edit their logos or their thing. Like if you have a, a jacket with Harley Davidson, they don't want you like drawing your own crap and stuff on it. Um, but they're okay if you you do other stuff. Um, the third thing, and this is the one where I it's kind of con, con what is that word uh, convoluted with uh, with some brands is the cutting up of items. Like let's say that you have a Harley Davidson jacket. Um, and you decide to cut it up and make it into a little handbag. There are a lot of companies that are like absolutely no, no on that. Like don't mess up our stuff. Don't cut it up. Even if it's real, Harley seemed okay with it. Again, they spelled it out. They were like, that's cool. As long as you're using real Harley stuff, the only rule they had is don't try to sell it as another product because we don't produce purses. So don't try to say Harley produced a purse. You're welcome to do it and keep it and use it. Just don't, you know, try to sell it. Yep. So the first myth on the viral list is if a brand is not on the list, they can't come after you. That is a myth. Um, We used Rose. Why do I keep forgetting what it is? Rosetta Stone. And we have a whole stack of Rosetta Stones sitting upstairs because we didn't know when we first started. Yeah. Um, We found them for like a buck. It's computer. um, Translation. Yeah. It's, it's, computer translation programs or whatever for language. Yeah. Um, and they come in like a pack you open it. Remember those three packs you would open and it would have like the three mm-hmm. CDs inside. They come like that. Well, we got a whole stack for a couple bucks. And then, um, when he went to comp them, we discovered we couldn't sell them. And now they're just sitting upstairs because we don't know what to do with them. We'll probably just donate them for the a right order. A order. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So Rosetta Stone is probably one of the nastiest companies that like they shoot stuff down constantly. Um, I would say if I second that one with software or CDs, it's P90X slash Beachbody. That would be the second one. Oh, yeah. They're they're mean too. Horrendous. Yeah. So P90X Beachbody, you guys know the What's that guy's name? Billy. I don't know. His, the guy, the, you know, the boxing guy, whatever. Uh, he has software CDs that they're a DBA, you know, Beachbody was the name of the company, but P90X was the program everyone knew. They will remove you, new, used, or otherwise, and they do not appear on the Vero list either, um, and they'll quickly get you. Uh, those two are probably the worst two, like right off the bat. Those yep. Two. Onesie is also very bad, as well as um, cannot use the word Velcro. Yep. So those two, so onesie and Velcro are a perfect example of not a product or a company, but a trademark being protected. So the word onesie is not actually an item. It's a trademarked name of a one piece suit that a baby wears. And it just so happens that Gerber has owned the word onesie, literally the word onesie since 1979. Mm-hmm. So you cannot use that word. You're absolutely within your rights to sell non-Gerber or Gerber one-piece baby outfits, but you must label them as such. One-piece suit, one-piece outfit, single piece, however you want to do it, just don't use the word onesie. Yes, and you can't use the word Velcro. You want to use hook and loop or sticky. Or um, latch, latch thing or whatever. Yeah. Hook and loop is the most common, I think, for shoes. But if I have animals who have Velcro on their hands, I'll just say they have sticky pads on their hands or sticky hands. <laughs> sticky pads. Sticky hands, sticky pads. Um, there's like a whole joke video on YouTube. Oh, yeah. The trademark lawyers from Velcro singing about how you can Protecting their, their trademark, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so companies trademark this stuff and they pay a lot of money and people think they're just being petty. But the problem is like, and, and I think it's petty, but I'm a petty person, but let's get over to the actual legalities if I'm being the bearer of bad news on their side. If you own the word Velcro and somebody s- creates another sticky product and starts slapping it on a lot of stuff and they're using your word Velcro and all of a sudden the Velcro doesn't work and that stuff's just falling apart because they made a cheap product, it's going to make you look cheap and bad. So, mm-hmm. uh, Or if, God forbid, you created a product that hurts somebody, then the liability could look bad on you. So I get it. I understand the protections. I think it sucks and I think it is petty, but that's just the way it works and they have to protect themselves. So the word Velcro is absolutely a no-go. Um, I put Grace comment on the screen because I want to answer it. But... The first myth is if it's not on the list, they can't come after you. And that is absolutely a myth. 
They do not have to be on the list to come after you. Platform-wise or legally? Platform-wise or legally. Yep. That leads into myth number two. If the brand is on the list, that means you can't sell it. Not necessarily true. Um, I sell 90% I sell of the brands that are on that list. Uh, American Eagle's on there. Harley's on there. Guess is on there. Express is on there. Um, all brands that I sell, they just literally mostly say, don't sell fake stuff. And that's the basis of it. If you go to the Vero site and you look at the different brands, Harley's is really cool, like Casey said. Yeah, read Harley's. They, They're great. they literally break it down. Like, you can cut our stuff up and be crafty and make your own items. Just don't sell them. We don't care what you do. You can sell our used stuff. Um, but most of them just basically break down to them saying, don't sell American Eagle unless it's authentic American Eagle. So they just want you to be selling um, authentic stuff. And again, that goes back to like the trademark on Velcro. They don't want you to sell anything that they haven't personally put their seal of approval on as this is our product and we stand behind it. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to be on the list to come after you. If they're on the list, you can still sell most of it. Okay. But the third myth, oh my gosh, the first sale doctrine. <laughs> <laughs> we like to tell everyone what the first sale doctrine is, Casey. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> you right, so I am, no, I don't want to. <laughs> I'll dumb it down. So the first sale doctrine is part of federal case law. Uh, I can't quote the law number. I have it saved somewhere, but I always forget. Um, basically says once you legally purchase an item, whether you buy it new, used, flea market, retail store, whatever it is, once you legally purchase it, now if you steal it, you don't have rights to it, but um, if you legally purchase an item and you are the owner of it, you have the right to pass on the sale of goods, which means you have the right to take it to a flea market or yard sale a day later and sell it yourself. Um, this was created, the, the case law was created, it's, it's quite old, decades old. It was created because Companies back then tried to stop people from selling their goods. And this was pre-e-commerce, pre-eBay, pre-Amazon, pretty pre much. Um, they didn't want, they figured, so let's say that I create a, 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 a cell phone and I sell it out to a thousand people. And all of a sudden, all thousand people are selling the used ones. It's potential that those thousand used ones being sold could have bought a new one for me, but they didn't because they got to use one cheap. So I'm potentially losing all these customers. So if they could shut down the resale of it, they would force customers to buy from me brand new. They would only have that choice. And the Supreme Court and the US government ruled that that was somewhat of a monopoly and that it wasn't giving consumers the a, a fair choice of product or a fair choice of avenue. And so it, it came under the Fair Consumers Act. Uh, it's called like FACA or something. And um, and as part of that, it was the first sale doctrine that said you had the right to legally resell your own goods. Now, with that said, big companies, uh, we always like to say, find every loophole in the world. And the biggest myth is that just because the first sale doctrine exists doesn't or means that you can sell whatever you want, which is True, you can sell it, but they can protect their trademark, which includes their name, their words, and their logo. So if I'm going to sell uh, this fancy tripod, I don't even know the name of it, but let's just call this Star's Tripod. And Star's Tripod has a big fat logo on it right here. And I take a picture of it to sell it. I've now infringed by illegally using her logo and her name, Star's Tripod. If I want to take a photo of it and cover that tri that logo and call it Black Tripod, there'd be nothing she could do. I could legally sell it. But I can't use her name and logo without permission. And that's the loophole they get you on. Yep. And most, most brands and companies are pretty chill about it, though. If you're yeah. selling their used stuff on eBay, they don't care. As long as you're selling authentic and not a knockoff. But that's how they'll get you. And that's what people don't. When I talked at the beginning of the video, how some people are hard headed and they don't want to listen <laughs> and they don't want to learn and they don't want to get educated. This is the point of contention that I and myself, Keith and Casey talk about with people all the time. Yes, you are protected by the law. If I own this vape right here, I bought this. This is mine. I can sell it. Well, it's 
nicotine, so probably not. <laughs> Let's use a better example. Let's use a pen. This is mine. I want to sell it. And I can under the first sales doctrine. And if street pricer there was a cool laid back company, they wouldn't care. But if they're the Rosetta Stone or a Velcro, they're going to say, yes, you own that under the first sale doctrine, you can sell it. But because you're using our trademark, we can now sue you for use of our intellectual property. So they're not coming after you for selling what you own. They're coming after you for using their trademark prop, their trademark and their mm -hmm. intellectual property, which is a loophole. And this is the point that people want to argue with and butt heads with us. But I own it. But I own it. But the first sale doctrine. Well, that's cool and all, but they can still get you for the trademark. Yeah. So, yeah. So I actually just pulled up my bookmark that I had. It was actually recognized originally in 1908, but the official law came into play in 1976. So we're talking way pre-e-commerce, which kind of foreshadowed its future in, in the rules. So the thing about it is, and, and if you read the first sale doctrine, it clearly says that that's the law with the limits of copyright as like a kind of subsection B, subsection two, subsection eight, like you are limited to a point. Obviously, let's say that I took, let's say that Star is an author and she sold a book and I bought her book. And then I decided to reproduce the book and reprint the book and sell it on my own. Absolutely not okay. You cannot reproduce a, a piece of work, an owned work. So, you know, yeah, somebody's gonna say, oh, you have a book, it's your right to resell it. Yeah, but I couldn't reproduce it. And so we see some stuff on TV, which we're gonna talk about in just a second, where somebody's literally printing a piece of work or reproducing a piece of work. And it's like, no, just because you bought the original one doesn't give you the right to just make new ones on your own. And the first sale doctrine, if you look it up, absolutely, it's 17 USC 109C gives a limited exception to the copyright owner's public display right and right to copyright protect themselves. And that's where they get you. Now, I will say as a caveat, there have been cases where people have fought back. It's cost a lot of money, which we'll also touch on, um, to fight big companies because they see it as big companies bullying little people, which is true. It, a lot of times it really is because look, they're not going to lose. Me and you aren't going to hurt their business, you know, selling a used shirt, whatever. But um, they fought back and spent the money to fought back and they have won. And it's, it kind of comes down to, you know, almost what judge you get, but certain, I, I see it in the first sale doctor in us code that certain case law can be over, like they're overstepping their boundaries, but I'm not going to be willing to risk the money to find out whether I'm right or not. It's insane amounts of money to even try to fight. It. And they have, they know it. They, um, so I'm going to answer. Thank you so much for the super chat. 99 cents super sticker from Greg. Super um, so Greg always gives me super chats for poops. <laughs> oh, um, I'm going to answer his question so I can move it off the screen. Yep. Um, so the reason eBay can't give people a warning or a potential danger message if the system sees buzzwords like they do with certain things. Um, I have listed, you know, brands that were called like new college toddler pants. And I list them as used toddler pants. And then I get that warning, your title contradicts other information in the listing. Do you still want to list? Because the system, the algorithm can absolutely pick up. This is used, but she said new in the title. But the reason they can't put those up for Vero is because every single brand's profile in that verified rights owner program or the Vero program, every single brand has a different profile and different rules and different things you can do what Harley says you can do is way different than American Eagle. So there's way too many variances. There's brands that aren't on the list. There's brands that have submitted profiles but asked to be hidden from the list. So there's no way that eBay could code all of that. There's just way too many different variances and different brands. There's just no way to do it. And when it comes down to it, it's not even eBay's fault or eBay's rules or eBay's decisions, it's the brands. It's the people who own that intellectual property at the end of the day who are going to decide what you can and can't do with their stuff. It has nothing to do with eBay. People get mad at eBay all the time. Oh, they made me take down my baby formula or they made me take down my onesie. It's not eBay doing it to you guys. It's the people who own that brand. Yep. Hey, mom, pause, go to pie. <laughs> 
Mom and Pa's closet. <laughs> I can't even talk tonight. Mom, Pa's, bleh. Hi. Hi. Yeah, so I was just scrolling down the um, the First Sale Doctrine some more. Uh, digital goods are not covered by First Sale Doctrine, just an FYI, because you are not reselling the actual item. You're reselling a copy of it. Uh, music CDs, that, that, was, that came about during like when music went digital and you bought something from like iTunes for a dollar, you don't actually own it. You're just getting a copy of it. So you don't have the right to resell it. Also the first sale doctrine uh, specifically covers the, um, the recreation of products. In other words, cutting up that Harley thing and making something else is good for personal use, but not resell. So that's why a lot of companies, it actually completely has a section covering that. Uh, also artwork, and uh, written in literature is also not covered because those are unique. Uh, every piece of artwork, even if somebody draws the same painting, is not I identically the same every single time. Um, so that is not covered. And it also, um, uh, the materially different part about like not being able to offer the warranty for brand new, that is specifically covered in the first sale that you are not protected from lawsuits and that. So you can, guys can read down that. But as far as like the standard first sale doctrine, it is good for you to resell uh, as long as you don't infringe on their rights. And that is just the way they get you. And, and that's what we're still. I would also like to add that I, I do believe the um, digital copy covers ebooks as well. You can't purchase an ebook and resell it because no. the author won't get their yep. product. So yeah, the, the, the authors created the original product. What you have received is a copy and you are not allowed to sell that as a copy of it. Same as like the music and all that stuff. It's not yeah, in fact, um, you know, I read a lot of ebooks and a lot of them will say in the beginning, if you have, if you have purchased this or borrowed this from your library to read, um, please do not share with your friends, encourage them to buy their own copy. Yeah. But they don't even want you to share ebooks with other people. And I understand that. I mean, mm -hmm. writing is not easy and it's their job and they deserve their, their money for their intellectual. That's what they do for a living. I can't imagine if, if everyone gave away books for free that authors would even write anymore. No, they wouldn't. Definitely not. And then I would be sad and mad at whoever ruined it for me. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so the fourth myth here is if you're contacted to take something down, you can just ignore it and keep doing what you're doing. That's a big myth because no, you need to stop. <laughs> if only it was that easy. <laughs> because it doesn't matter if the company's contacting you or eBay is. If you choose to just ignore it and do whatever the heck you want to do, you're going to get your account suspended at the very least. And worst case, you're going to get sued. Mm -hmm. And Remember. so you can't, like, if a cop says to you, you can't, you can't speed on this road anymore. I'm going to let you go with the warning. And he doesn't write you a ticket. And then he gets back in his car and you get it back in your car. You speed off. Guess what's going to happen? <laughs> He's yep. probably going to pull you over again and give you a ticket this time. Yep. Um, so you have to consider when you're contacted and you're given a warning or giving a, given a chance to pull it down without being suspended or sued. That's your warning. That's kind of the same logic of a cop or a policeman pulling you over and letting you go with the warning. He's saying what you did was wrong, but I don't want to get you in trouble yet. So just don't do it anymore. I'm just, I'm reading more case law, but um, there's, uh, to add to that myth of like, so you have to remember eBay is not a, a court of law. They're going to protect their website because if a website or platform doesn't enforce a trademark takedown, they can open their self up to liability. That happened to eBay about a decade ago over in Europe. And then here when, you know, like Louis Vuitton bags were running rampant on eBay with fakes. Uh, Louis Vuitton, the owner of the Louis Vuitton company, the guy, is, his name is Renault. He's like the fifth most richest guy in the world, sued eBay and forced them to put that Vero, play, that Vero program into place because there were so many fake you know, Louis bags and purses and shoes and all this stuff at the time um, that he was like, either you enforce it or we'll enforce it. And the court agreed, like eBay had to put something into place. And as part of that, if they get a legitimate takedown notice from a company, they're under legal requirement to take it down. They don't get to decide whether it's fake or not. You have to contact the company and get approval after they've taken it down and say, hey, this is legitimate. Can I get the okay? And then you have to convince a company like Louis Vuitton or 
whomever to contact eBay and be like, hey, this guy's cool. He's selling real stuff. Uh, go ahead and let him up. Uh, let me tell you the chances of that happening, just FYI. <laughs> Yep, I'm, and I'm realizing I really do have a resting bitch face, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> I flipped over to the YouTube screen just to check the comments, and I'm like, man, I look bored and mean. I promise you, I'm not. That's not all she's got. <laughs> <laughs> got right, jokes. So, <laughs> yeah, you're funny. Ah. Um, I just like look like I'm frowning. I'm, I'm not. All right, so the last myth kind of ties in with that. So most folks think if a lawyer contacts them via email or through the eBay message system that it's a scam, they immediately think, well, if they were a real lawyer or a real, you know, law company, yeah. they would send me paper mail. Yeah. That's not necessarily true because these companies, again, hire people to do nothing but, as their full-time job, go online and find who's selling the product, who's selling knockoffs, potentially, who's using the word Velcro, who's using the word onesie. I mean, these companies literally hire people, give them 10 bucks an hour to sit on a room for eight hours a day and go on eBay and Etsy and Poshmark and Amazon and Facebook Marketplace and Instagram and find out who's selling their products where and how they're doing it. Yep. And then they'll just contact you usually through the platform you're doing it on as a courtesy. They don't mm -hmm. have to case you already mentioned that they do not have to give you a cease and desist. Nope. They could just serve you with papers and take you to court. Yup. So here's, here's the side of that. People always say that like, oh, they wouldn't be wasting their time with a zero feedback. It doesn't matter if it's zero feedback. A lot of them have zero feedback because they don't actually buy and sell on eBay. They're just using that account literally to message people. So you just said it, they're paying somebody 10 or $12 an hour, <clears throat> excuse me, $15 an hour to sit in a, um, <laughs> to sit in an office and you know, they're spending $600 a week, $2,400 a month. So where's the benefit to them? Well, there's two sides to it. So one is their hope is by shutting enough people down and less, you know, sales on that end that it'll filter more sales to them directly. So that's one side. The second side, obviously brand protection and, you know, trademark protection. But the bigger part is when they actually do file lawsuits, they demand people pay them like, hey, uh, you know, 2,500 bucks, we'll, we'll, we'll let this go. Even if they just get one or two people to flip, which they always do, trust me, I can give you personal experience on it. It is worth it to them. They're not spending tons and tons of money. Now, my personal experience, uh, they were trying to make an example out of a lot of people. They did spend a lot of money, but they recovered a lot too. Um, they, they're paying a paralegal. That isn't the lawyer emailing you. It's a paralegal. And, and even some of them even say it, they say like their name or whatever, and you look them up and they're a paralegal, but uh, we just had one the other day in the group. So mm -hmm. they, they are, they're just doing it like literally to troll all day. That's all that person has to do. And they, the, the problem is if you ignore it, cause people are like, oh, well without a legal notice, like you said, or without certified mail, right. The message system is, is definitely a courtesy. I even see North Face sends letters through the mail. Some companies will buy an item from you just to get your information and then they will contact you directly or they'll you know, send the cease and desist to you. The thing about that is if you ignore it, if you don't do what they say or you don't at least acknowledge it, there's a 50-50 chance that the next time they contact you will be via a certified lawsuit or a process server. And at that point, it's too late. You have to respond. And let me give you guys some breakdowns of numbers. Um, was it 2013? So seven years ago, uh, I'm walking in from a lunch and this little short guy comes scurrying up. He reminds me of like one of the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory guys. I mean, he was like four foot tall, little short guy. <laughs> Toyota Corolla, uh, you know, glasses, bald head, 40s, comes doo -doo 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 up to me with a box, like straight up box that would hold 1,100 sheets of paper in a stack. It was 1,100 sheets and goes, uh, are you Casey? Well, yeah, can I help you? And he goes, you're served and just drops the box in front of me. And I'm like, holy crap. Just to get a lawyer to read that box, because I got through about four pages and was like, nope, not doing it. Just to get him to read it was $2,500 before he'd even opened the box. By the time we had responded to it the first time, gone through it, 
wrote up a response, certified, I sent it back. I was out six grand in one month, $6,000 just to reply to it. Over <laughs> two months, I spent $67,000 and never stepped foot in a courthouse just to go our separate ways and say, nobody wins, nobody loses. Literally. $67,000 to pursue it. Cause I was like, Oh, I'm going to fight it. No, you can't. No. And they, the thing is they have the 67,000 laying around. Yeah. And most people don't have the 6,000 to even respond. So it, the thing is you don't want to let it get to that point. I'm not saying just send people money, but I'm saying don't just write it off and ignore it. Like the, the, the answer, you know, this is going to be our follow-up question. People are going to say, well, what do we do? Take it down. Don't list anymore. And if you feel compelled to respond, just say, oh, I got this, you know, from a friend or I got it at, at a flea market. I had no idea and I'll never sell it again. I don't have any more. I apologize. And most of them will never, ever, you know, get in contact with you again. A lot of the message I see just ask, like it just says it's been taken down and there's no contact from the company. If they don't contact you at all, don't, I wouldn't go out of my way to contact them. Let it go. If it's just a takedown, like I got my Minecraft shirt taken down, just just be done with it. Don't list anything ever again. You're good. But yep. if they do physically send you a letter or they reach out to you directly and they are asking a bunch of questions, you should consider responding and just using one of those answers is like, oh, I just sell stuff from flea markets or, or from a, you know, a yard sale. Yard sale is probably best. And just say, I, that's the only one I had or the only two I had. And I took them down. They're gone. You're welcome to them or I'll destroy them, whatever you want me to do, but done. And they'll just go, yep. okay. I've never seen anyone get in trouble that you use that excuse or gone after it. So no, and you just be honest. I thrift stuff and resell it, and I I sell all one offs. It's not like I have thousands of these to sell. You want to let them know clearly you thrifted it. Yeah. Um, but the myth that they have to contact you through snail mail is absolutely incorrect. They will contact you through snail mail or serve you in person once they're actually suing. Yeah. If it gets to that point, it's too late. <laughs> it's too but if they send you a message on eBay, they can um, do that as a courtesy to kind of like a cease and desist. And I think what a lot of folks like to say in the Facebook groups, um, it's not a lawyer if they're contacting you through eBay, it's your competitor. It's somebody that wants to not compete with you and sell the same thing. Yeah. Has it ever happened? Maybe. Yeah. There's a lot of bad people in the world that do bad, shitty things. Excuse my language. But there's scammers that scam us. Buyers, you know, that scam sellers. Um, it can happen. There's people that murder people. There's serial killers. There's bad people in this world who do bad things. So is it possible that someone would ever pose themselves as an attorney or an attorney's assistant and contact you just because they don't want the competition? I mean, it's possible, but do you want to take that risk? Because if you just ignore no. it, you're going to get sued if it's not. And I, I think the likelihood of that really happening with most of us here and my subscribers, y'all, we sell plush and use clothes. We don't really have competitors that really seriously no. want you to take down all your Winnie the Poohs so they don't have to compete with your Winnie the Poohs. Yep. That's true. The, the competition thing is rare and far few between. We see messages all the time and they're almost always legitimate. Um, I'll give you one. This was a long time ago, year and a half, two years ago. Somebody that we both know, I can't say who, but was selling um, like, I might have one laying here. Yeah. It was just a little adapter, not this, but something close to this was literally how big it was. And it connected like a speaker, like a little mini speaker to an airplane plug-in. I'm not even kidding. It was such a niche item. But it was a an adapter that was specifically made for Bose, and uh, they had like 300 of them <laughs> on eBay, quantity 300. And sure enough, Bose bought one, and they weren't actually Bose adapters; they were third party. Like this is an actual after Apple adapter, but if I, there, you know, there's a million people that sell these adapters third party, and so Bose sued him, and it was no joke because he was paying like three dollars a piece and selling them for I think 20, so it was great profits. But they weren't legitimately authentic Bose adapters and they nailed him. So he didn't really have a defense like, oh yeah, 300, 300 uh, adapters in stock. And they were, you know, I think he ended up just having to tell him where he got them from and they let him out of it. He had to spend a couple grand to respond, but 
just over something like that. So yeah, you've got used Winnie the Pooh and t-shirts. You're probably all set. Yeah. Like he had 300, so he couldn't say, hey, I, it's a one-off. No, he I didn't. I to share with you these jeans I just sold. 42.75. How much? 42.75. Still not my 45. <laughs> the Heritage by America 71776 jeans. <laughs> Those will be in my what sold video come Monday. Anyway, I got I got excited. I'm like, I saw forty dollars. I, I heard it. That's like yeah. <laughs> nicely done, nicely done. So yeah, so don't you know? Don't believe also in Facebook groups. There's a lot of people that will tooth and nail fight it, argue. Don't look. I wouldn't give you guys the information if I didn't know. Why would I scare people? I'm not here to scare you because it's rare you'll get a message. Anyways, just be careful and handle it the correct way if you get it. Um, I have personal experience on a much grander scale that was huge. That is never going to happen to anybody. And if it does, then you're probably into, you know, selling products that are, are far more quantity, far more price, far more high risk, uh, which is part of the reason I don't do what I did. Um, what I did was perfectly fine. And it ended up being reaffirmed in federal court in Kansas a year later, but it cost the guy that fought it $175,000. I didn't have $175,000 you know, laying around and it wouldn't have been worth it for me anyways. Cause he never got that money back. He tried to get legal fees and did not get the legal fees back. They allowed him to continue selling what he was selling, but he only made like $30,000 a year off of that, you know, product line. And I was like, dude, it's going to take you all of like six years to get your money back. That's crazy. Not. And at the time I was probably on that particular product, maybe selling 30 or 40 a month, maybe a couple hundred for the year, making like 20, $30 a piece, $40 a piece. So I was only going to make eight or 10 grand at most off of it. And I'm like, oh, that would take me a lifetime to recover the legal fees to be able to legally sell it. I'm good. We'll just walk away. So, um, yeah, it's usually just not even worth it, especially, you know, if your entire business is hedged around selling Minecraft t-shirts and you're making a hundred grand a year, then maybe you want to consider fighting it. Um, but if you're selling one Minecraft shirt every five months, don't bother. Right. Just don't sell it anymore. It's not easy. All right. So we got about, 15 minutes ish to just touch upon knockoffs. Knockoffs guys are anything that is made to clearly appear to be something it's not. So if you've ever seen the fake Louis Vuittons, the L and the V are inverted, but it's clearly made. So that just at first glance, do you think it's Louis Vuitton? Um, you know, they knock off pretty much everything. True religion, jeans. I talk a lot about how to authenticate those on my jeans videos. Um, I think they used to knock off Lucky Brand, but not so much because they're... Used to be a long time ago. Not so much anymore. Well, they've been ran to the bottom. They're not worth anything. <laughs> um, yeah. But Louis Vuitton's a big one. Um, Kate Spade. Coach. Um... Oh, what's that one that does the Disney versus Burke? Something. Oh, uh, Dooney and Burke. Dooney and Burke. Um, and then shoes are a big one. But anything that is made to appear to be something else, whether it's a designer brand or not, and sold at a more affordable price, that is a knockoff and it is illegal. So the myths on knockoffs are... It's okay to sell a knockoff because I didn't know better. It's okay to sell a knockoff if I don't use the brand name. Or it's okay to sell it because um, if I admit it's a knockoff. All three of those are incorrect. Just because you didn't know, again, that falls back on that ignorance thing. If you sell a knockoff and you didn't know it was a knockoff, you're still liable. Yep. You got to learn how to authenticate your items. And if you don't know how, there are places that will do it for you. eBay has an authentication program. I think Poshmark has one now. The real real. The, I was supposed to say the real real. I have a whole pile of handbags I'm saving up until I have enough to send in. To send in a box. Yeah, yeah, I have like a couple uh, Coach. I have a couple Kate Spade. I have um, Dooney and Burke. Dooney. And then I have... Oh, what's the other big handbag brand? I think it's Louis Vuitton. And I have a, yeah, 
this, the whole stack I'm saving, and I can't tell. So guess what? I'm going to send them to the real real because mm -hmm. I don't know how. But when it comes to genes, I know how to authenticate my own genes because that's my yeah. specialty. So, but it comes to your problem. You have to learn how to authenticate. And if you don't know how, you can learn how. You can send it away. Um, some places like Coach, from what I understand, you can walk in and ask them. Is this yours? Coach usually will, yeah. Louie won't do it. Coach will. Um, uh, Michael Kors will. If you have a Michael Kors story, they'll do it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the real real is the real real though. They did a test on them, and it was like a 90, 92 percent success rate. Only a couple items that passed through were actually not real, and they're really good. Uh, I don't know their fees. I can't even tell you. I've never sold through them. I don't feel any handbags. Huh? They take the responsibility. So yeah. it's kind of like having a someone do your taxes for you. If they screw it up and you're audited, they're responsible for that audit. They have to deal with it. Yep. So if you send it to the real world, it's kind of the same thing. Even if they're wrong 8% of the time, it's their issue now, not yours. But I don't know what their fees are or anything. I don't know their, I, I used to, I was trying to look up the real world's fees right now. Um, the other thing about uh, the fake ones is, you know, if you do send it into those companies, they will, uh, I think they have a policy where they'll dispose of them and you don't have to worry about it, have all that. So uh, real world's mm -hmm. fees. I was trying to see. Uh, but you have to know. So not knowing isn't an excuse. The if I I can sell a knockoff if I don't use the brand name wrong. You if it's a knockoff, it is illegal to sell. It doesn't matter if you use the brand name or even if you admit it's a knockoff. I see that one a lot. A lot of people tend to think as long as you say, "Hey, this is a Louis Vuitton knockoff purse." That it's legal to That's sell. That's my favorite. <laughs> it's not okay. It's not. That's like saying, hey guys, I have some illegal meth. Just because you said it's meth and that it's illegal, you still can't sell it unless you're an organ. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Disclosing that it's fake does not get you out of the liability. And uh, I got to I gotta mention it because we haven't mentioned it yet and I don't want to forget. But two things. One, just because somebody else is doing it doesn't mean it's okay or somebody else told you to. But just because you saw it on Netflix doesn't mean that, all right, I got it. You know, let's, let's go with Irene Karma. I don't know. Call it what you want. I, I Karma. Um, everyone knows, I'll just say it. The Netflix show Slobby Robbie uh, buys and sells vintage stuff all the time. And the problem I have with him is not what he does. It's that when he gets back to his shop, he was having this little like runway show at his shop or whatever. He's literally in the back of his store printing Gucci shirts with G's on them, but he didn't put the word Gucci on it. But he's clearly calling them Gucci bootlegs. First of all, if you call it inauthentic, fake, illegal, knockoff, or bootleg, it's, it is, they're all the same. Just because you, you print something up and don't put the word Gucci on it, but you use the clear G's that are Gucci's logo, it is a knockoff. It is illegal, and you can call it bootleg, whatever you want. It's still not okay. First of all, if you were just buying and selling those, you could get in trouble. But actually being the one that's producing them is like a federal felony. I don't know how the guy's not in jail. Our only guess is that he agreed for entertainment purposes or he made a deal with the companies. There's got to be something behind the scenes that we don't know. Otherwise, the guy would be in federal prison, I assure There's you. There's no way that he's doing that and yeah. really doing that. That's like so, peace theory is it's for entertainment purposes only. Yeah. So like he was cutting up Louis Vuitton purses and making slip on slippers. And that, like we said, that's cool. You can do that for your own personal good, but you can't sell the items. He was selling them to customers and Louis Vuitton would have any company really would have a real problem with that. And he's openly advertising that. Now that's kind of a, you know, he legally owned a real Louis purse and made something out of it. So that's kind of splitting hairs. And if Louis went after him for that, I'd kind of be like, yeah, it's kind of petty. Like it was his purse. He could do whatever. But the whole printing Gucci shirts in the back office is not petty and not okay and, and just adding to the influx of fake goods. Now, here's the other side of it. I want everyone to listen to this really, really carefully. People claim that if you don't use the name or the logo on it, which he did, but if it's different, like let's say Gucci has two Gs and you add a little drippy drop thing on the tops and bottoms and make it different. It still looks just like it, but it's a little different. You guys see those fake Louis purses where there's LV, but instead it's like LW and it looks all the crazy thing. Um, you can still, 
incur responsibility for that. So I'll give you two great examples and people are going to mind blown. Chewy Vuitton is a dog toy that was not licensed by Louis Vuitton. It was called Chewy Louis Vuitton. And your dog did to, that with me. <laughs> yeah, Louis came after them hardcore. I don't remember what the outcome of that case was. You can look, somebody can look it up. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess Chewy Vuitton was not successful. That was several years ago. The second one, which is even more mind blowing, I think everyone here is probably familiar with Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville. Um, the music, the restaurant, he owns the trademark Margaritaville, obviously. That is a hundred million dollar a year operation, the restaurants and the, and the merchandise uh, beyond his music. And there was a company in Colorado who opened up called Marijuanaville. Obviously, Colorado, it's legal. They were a you know, an edible shop and other things. Jimmy Buffett sued them for confusion to customers. A product that will confuse a customer is not covered and not legal. And he said that customers could be confused that his margarita business was now in the marijuana business and that he doesn't have anything to do with marijuana, which I highly doubt Jimmy Buffett, but let's stay on track here. <laughs> he claimed that the company had nothing to do with that and he didn't wanna be confused with a marijuana dealer. Uh, even though it was legal, he didn't wanna be confused that his company was providing the services and he won in federal court Go figure. I think that was in like 2018, 2019 in Colorado. Um, so anyways, he sued them and he won. Marijuanaville, Margaritaville, two totally different names, two totally different logos, nothing the same except a play on words. And she lost. The lady that owned that place lost that federal lawsuit. Look it up. And so that tells you like if somebody puts a LW but makes it look just like a Louie, there could be confusion and they could lose, just like Chewy Vuitton is totally different. Chewy, everybody knows it's a dog toy. Louis Vuitton doesn't make that. They still, pretty sure they won that lawsuit. So just know that even though you change something a little bit, it could still confuse the customer and that's part of trademark law. So don't forget that. Mm -hmm. And just because everyone else has it listed, it just means they haven't been caught yet. <laughs> yeah, that too. So um, yeah, that was 2007, wow it's kind of a long, I mean, this is an extreme, but if you say, well, everyone else is robbing convenience stores or everyone else is murdering people and getting away with it, doesn't mean it's okay for you to do it. It just means they haven't been caught yet. Just yeah. because you see other people with stuff listed on eBay that they shouldn't have up, they just have not been caught. Um, and I, I personally, I have a very good moral compass and I have very good business ethics. In fact, I'm probably honest to a fault gets me in trouble, I'm so honest. But <laughs> even if I wasn't who I am with my like really high morals, I am always the person who gets in trouble. <laughs> so a <laughs> hundred people could do something and get away with it and I'd be the one that would get caught and get in trouble. It's just the way it is. Um so I don't you gotta sleep at night, you gotta do you, but just because you see other people doing it, I don't think you should do it either. I think I think that it's not an excuse. And just because you saw on Netflix, just because somebody in Casey's group who probably doesn't know the first thing about anything says it's okay, it doesn't mean so, it's okay. So I did live here on the video. I just got an education and one more exception. So I just looked up the Chewy Vuitton lawsuit. They won the lawsuit. But I know why. So here's why. They initially lost the lawsuit and then they won. It was overturned. It's a parody satirical product of comedic value. This is straight from the federal court. So apparently if you make a comedy sketch parody, which is why Saturday Night Live has never been sued and put off TV. Um, if you watch Saturday Night Live, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you do a satirical parody of comedic value, you can knock off anything you want. <laughs> well, you know what? That's probably how Weird Al gets away with it, too. That's right. There you go. Weird Al Yankovic, because he's doing it for comedic value and parodies. And that's how a lot of magazines and things get away with satire. Yeah. How are these dealers getting away with using stock photos, especially on Poshmark? That's a good question. What do you think? Uh, because stock photos are so, it's the same reason for anything. There's not enough manpower to take them all down. Uh, thousands of stock photos get removed every day. I literally used to get messages on a daily basis. Um, 
Stock photos aren't, aren't allowed because the photos are trademarked. It's a, just back to what we were talking about, uh, music and, and uh, authors and stuff like that. Uh, those companies like an American Eagle model, you know, modeling a sweater, they paid the model, they paid the photographer, they paid the editor, they paid the light kit, the studio and all this stuff. They own the, the IP when uh, my fiance is a photographer and when she goes, they have release forms for the photos, like literally release forms, like what you can and can't do with it or whether you're allowed to reuse it or re, you know, you can't re-edit her stuff without permission. There's all kinds of stuff that photographers sign. So when the photographer makes those photos for the brand and, and gives it to them, they have an agreement between the company and the photographer, whatever it is, like you can use it, you can't, you can't transfer that to somebody else. So stealing someone's photos is not allowed, but because it's so prevalent and there's so many millions of them floating around, there's just not enough manpower to, to report them all and take them all down. It doesn't make it illegal. Will you get in trouble? Yeah, chances are pretty low, but it happens all the time. Yeah. Um, so it's the same way with anything. If you look up Velcro on eBay, you're going to see a ton of people using it. Yeah. It's, there's not, you know, there, the, like we've mentioned several times, these companies do pay people as a full-time job to go online and seek these things out. But it's not like they're paying hundreds of millions of dollars a year to hundreds of millions of employees. No. They have some employees that they pay and they'll catch some people. Yeah, that's right. And some don't get caught. There you go. Okay for everybody. Don't roll the dice, guys. Just go about it. But at the end of the day, it you know, most stuff that you list should be okay. You shouldn't run into too many problems. If you do, just take it down, move on, and keep rolling. It's one item. Yep. Um, I think we covered everything that we got on the list here. So do you guys have any last minute questions, comments, concerns do you want us to answer or address before we go? We are at the uh, hour mark here. Oh, we are at an hour. Look at that, 8.01, boom, boom. Yeah, <laughs> nice. yeah so just don't be scared of Vero's. Uh, I don't like to do fear mongering because I complain about it enough in today's day and age as it is, but just be cautious and uh, just be, um, you know, know that if it happens to you, don't freak out, don't panic. Chances are you won't get sued as long as you don't defy them and go crazy. And if you have questions, just reach out to one of us. We'll help you. Yeah, if you have questions, reach out. Um, another thing I would say is if you know any veteran sellers that you trust, like me, Casey, Megan Mawenny, Robert, just check our stores. If we're selling American Eagle, chances are that that's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're pretty educated on Vero. We're pretty educated on what we're selling and what we're allowed to do and not. We've been doing it for a while. We all are pretty honest people with good morals and good business ethics. So if you've yeah. got, yes, I am. Oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, if, if Katie and Vicky, they do things by the book. Um, just look at some trusted folks' stores. And if we you trust see, them. Hmm? We trust them. Yeah. Are you done being a smart ass? Because now the people that are new are going to be like, wait, everything Star is saying is, is a lie. <laughs> we do trust them. We love Katie and Vicky. Yeah, we do. So just look at the stores of some people that you know who do things right and that you trust. If if you look in my store and you see a ton of American Eagle, then it's okay. I've checked the Vero. I'm good. I know mine are authentic. I don't really think people are knocking off. But um, if you look in my store and you don't see something – Chances are it's one of the things that you're not allowed to sell. So you can reach out, ask me, ask Casey, ask in our Facebook groups. We both have Facebook groups. Although I would ask in mine before I asked in his. Because whatever they ask in your group, it turns into an argument and people fighting. I have to say that my Facebook group is a lot more calm. It's full of a lot nicer people who don't fight. <laughs> Truth hurts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the people in my group are really super nice. You can be totally new and ask the dumb questions and they don't rip you or anything. We got to get that changed. <laughs> you need to have nicer people in your group. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go hardcore advertise your group and my group and push everyone over to it. No. <laughs> I like my nice group. My number one rule for my group is don't be a turd. No wonder I'm not in it anymore. You're a moderator in it. What are you talking about? Oh, that's how I get to stay. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, guys. Don't forget to hit the thumbs up. I did put Casey's YouTube channel down in the box. I mean, 
if you don't know it by now, you have been living in a hole. Um, thrift or retail world. Mine's flipping hippos. Flip hips. Yep. Back to work, guys. I got a lot to do. So it's it's cool. I love Something. spending time. I love spending time over here. Have me more often. Yeah. Do you have anything to say to the people? Thank you, guys. Uh, happy holidays to everyone if I don't talk to you. And uh, be safe and have fun. And uh, I'll be around if you need. Okay. Go be productive. Go make some money. And as always, thank you for watching. You guys are the best. I love you guys. Bye.